Thanks again. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for your interest. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Thank you, Nick. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, certainly been a tumultuous last several trading days. And uh, we'll see what happens from here. Um, hold on. Here we go. Um, so it's the outlook. Um, so where are we today? Despite a 5% correction in the last few weeks, which was pretty much reversed yet Monday and yesterday, earnings have beaten expectations um, pretty persistently quarter after quarter this year. And interest rates remain in a narrow trading range between uh, 130 and 175 on the 10 year. Earnings uh, at mid year looked like they'd be closer to 185. Now it looks like S&P earnings this year will be about 205. Um, consensus forecasts at the moment for the next two years are in the 220, 225 area for 2022 and the 240 to 250 area for 2023. Uh, obviously, those will be impacted by both the rate of growth and inflation between now and the end of 2023. So the PE uh, is over 20. It's uh, after the rally the last couple of days, closer to 21 based on 2022 earnings. Uh, that's certainly a premium to what's normal, which is about 15 to 17 times. Uh, the 10-year treasury, uh, as noted, is been hovering in that range between 1.3 and 1.5 for the last week, it's toward the top end of that range now. Give you some perspective, it was around a half a percent uh, about uh, 14, 16 months ago. And it was 175 uh, in March as we were uh, approaching the peak growth of this cycle. However, there's been a notable flattening in changing the shape of the yield curve. Um, Two-year treasuries are now trading at about uh, approaching three quarters of a percent. Uh, and um, they were uh, awful close to zero uh, at the same time in mid 2020. So clearly, there's been substantial movement up in the short end of the curve. That's obviously in anticipation that the Fed will start to raise rates some point next year. Uh, a zero Fed funds rate, which is where we're at now, uh, inflates assets. It justifies a higher normal, a higher than normal PE. It also justifies higher values for your home for bonds, for gold, for Bitcoin, whatever assets that you might put spendable or investable money into. But it has also created a bit of euphoria and speculation, and we can go, in that, uh, go into that in a little bit of time. All right, so continue with where we are today. Uh, the Fed at, the, at its next FOMC meeting in a week, um, it's almost certain to accelerate the pace at which it announced that it would start to reduce its pace of bond purchases. So it was purchasing $120 billion per month in treasuries and mortgage backs, and is likely to take that number down in $30, million, $30 billion increments per month to zero by next spring. Uh, Congress has gotten in the act. They've passed over $4 trillion in incremental spending and is trying to pass another $1.5 trillion uh, at the moment. Uh, that are, there is some doubt as to what will pass, if anything. Uh, but it's a, even if nothing were to pass, it's a monumental amount of cash infused uh, by the government into the economy. And while the Democrats like to say that everything is fully paid for, only a fraction of uh, this is fully paid for. Um, GDP uh, will accelerate from third quarter into the fourth quarter, reaching about 7% for the year. It, it may approach 10% in the fourth quarter. A part of that is the alleviation of supply chain problems a bit. A problem is, um, part of that is the recovery from the peak fears about the Delta environment that we saw in late summer and early fall. Uh, as you saw over 
Thanksgiving weekend, people had seemed to be uh, have show li very little reticence to travel, uh, to take vacations, to go to restaurants, etc. Um, and and for the most part, even with the advent of Omicron, which is simply, in my view, another variant, um, with the exception of New York City, which is going to put harsh restrictions in place for four days in the transition period between mayors, um, for the most part, um, officials are taking wait and see attitude before they take steps to tighten again. Inflation has ramped up throughout the year. Uh, it's been about 7% in October and November. Uh, there are signs that some of those prices are rolling over. Uh, lumber rolled over first, though it has started to climb back. Uh, we're seeing some change uh, down in the rate of acceleration in um, metals. We're um, seeing more of a deceleration in oil and gas, it's not a sharp deceleration, but uh, WTI prices, which were up around 80, are now uh, hovering around 70. So it's a step in the right direction. Meanwhile, money supply growth and bank deposits continue to rise at a double digit pace, 12, 13%. That money is sloshing around. Uh, it doesn't earn anything in a bank account. And the longer the stock market and other speculative assets continue to go up, the more likely that that money is going to leave uh, money market funds and banks and head into SPACs and Bitcoin. So um, there's nothing that supports a speculative boom uh, more than more money. The savings rate, uh, it peaked at over 30% in the summer of 2020. Uh, when the government was sending lots of checks in the mail and we were all bunkered, hunkered down in our homes and the only way we could spend it was online, had something delivered in a brown box. No planes, no restaurants, no travel, no parties, no business conferences, no trips to the office, no vacation. So that has all unwound and the savings rates are now down into a 7% range, which has been normal for the past 15 or 20 years. Okay, I'm gonna show you three slides in a moment. Um, one is gonna show you the dramatic rise and retreat I just talked about with the savings rate. Slide two is gonna look at CPI and slide three is gonna look at longer term inflation expectations. And we need to look at that in relation to the other um, slide two. So here's the savings rate. Uh, you can see the shaded area on the right side, which is the brief recession we had during COVID-19. You can see the spike in rates really right at that peak in the spring of 2020. It, it, when we first reopened in the spring, uh, it fell down to 15%, but then uh, we've got, uh, we had another surge in the fall uh, we saw more restrictions put back in place. And then we had the Delta variant, which, as you can see, uh, just gave you a small um, uh, increment later in 2021. Um, while the savings rate has gotten back to normal, we still have a huge amount of accumulated savings that have yet to be spent. And that explains the uh, rapid uh, rise in uh, bank deposits. Now, CPI, which uh, this is a little bit longer chart, but I could go back 10 years and you'd see the CPI in the same 1% to 3% range until we came upon the recession uh, related to COVID. It, uh, it dropped even further because everyone was cutting prices to liquidate inventory because they wanted to convert everything to cash. But since uh, mid-2020, prices have been on a pretty steady rise. And uh, as I noted earlier, uh, the most recent reports show an annualized rate of close to 7%. Um, yet, this is a, a different chart, which looks at the 10-year break-even inflation rate, which is really the spread between TIPS bonds and 10-year uh, treasuries. And you can see that that rate has remained fairly steady around two and a half percent 
for the last uh, since spring. Um, so it was about two four, got up maybe as high as two seven uh, at when inflation uh, numbers were at a peak. Uh, and now they're back under 2.5. So the market is telling you um, that it does not expect over an extended period of time that inflation is going to um, that inflation is going to stay anywhere near the six to seven percent where we are today. All right, so let's look at inflation and why why has it happened and, and why is it probably going to come down and what do we mean? Uh, what does this all mean? So we all know that you know supply chains create shortages. Supply chains came around because everybody converted inventory to cash. There was no inventory anywhere in the spring and summer of 2020 suddenly emerged. We went out and started to buy things, whether they be cars or homes or clothes or plane tickets. And nobody had capacity to absorb all that. So the obvious impact was immediately higher prices for everything. And um, we saw this past spring, um, you saw visions of open houses for house, homes for sale on Thursday. People would line up over the weekend. Um, realtors would accept bids, open envelopes on Monday and sell the highest bidder. The highest bidder normally bids something over the asking price of um, the home. That has settled down a bit, uh, but even today, according to uh, Realtor.com, one third of homes sell within one week of listing. So uh, it's still a very strong market out there. And we were doing um, one and a half million housing starts for years on average for 40 years. And after the housing bubble burst in uh, 2005, leading to the recession of 2008 and nine, um, the number of housing starts fell into a one to one and a quarter million range. And as a result, we're probably a couple million housing units short of where uh, we need to uh, equal demand. That means, of course, that housing prices have gone up. Um, they probably will not go up at the same pace they've gone up over the last year, uh, but they're not going down. And even the markets that were weak, uh, for instance, Center City, Philadelphia, um, Manhattan and New York, uh, they have gotten stronger of late. So it's pervasive. It's all price ranges. It's all product categories. And housing matters when you look at the economy in terms of activity and when you look at inflation. Wages are also increasing accelerated pace. The most recent labor report shows that 4.2% is our current unemployment rate. There was a time before 2018, 19, that that was considered full employment. We did get under four, so there may be a little bit room left. Uh, the, one of the factors that's confounded people has been the persistent drop in labor participation rate since the end of COVID. Some of that is COVID related. Uh, if uh, one or more parents needs to stay home with uh, kids or they need to stay home themselves because they're immunocompromised, they may not be in the labor force. About two and a half million people retired during the pandemic. Um, one of the factors that increased retirement was the rise in the stock market and the rise in home prices. People who thought their nest eggs weren't large enough and continue to work past traditional retirement dates, say 65 or so. Um, now that the market has gone up 20 or 30 percent, and now that their home is worth more and they can sell it and capitalize and capture that price, um, they are doing exactly that, and they are retiring, and those people are not going to come back to the workforce. We did see some encouraging signs in the last labor report, or last two labor reports, of some increase, and that probably relates to the end of the extended unemployment benefit programs that essentially paid anyone who wanted to lie on their couch uh, $15 an hour until they got back to work. Those programs have, and the extended programs have ended. Uh, they Benefits have been cut in half, returning to where they were. And uh, seven and a half dollars an hour doesn't cut it. So uh, some of those people are going back to work. 
Uh, so that is a bit of an encouraging sign. And with more people going back to work, uh, some of the labor shortages we've been seeing for months are being alleviated. This is a chart of the labor participation rate. You can see on the right side that it is starting to squiggle back up a little bit, but it is still well below where it was um, pre-pandemic in the 63% area. Note that male participation uh, peaked at over 90% 40 years ago. Female participation rate, uh, which rose steadily um, through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and even into the first decade of the century, has start, had started to roll over and decline a bit um, over the last five years. And, and that is demographically related. A lot of the ladies who went into the workforce reached an retirement, retirement age and left. The number of people leaving exceeded the number of people entering because again, demographic trends, the, there was a, relatively a relative trough in birth rates for those 16 to 20 over the last, uh, well, it's 16, 20 years ago. So at the beginning of this century. Um, whoop. Excuse me, I have to get back to, let me. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, just click on the chart and then you'll be able to advance the slide. Uh, I want to resume share. Okay, let's see. Here Still, we go. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So the the rise in the commodity prices, as well as prices of products in the short supply, uh, will begin to flatten out. If you go to an auto deal, if you went to an auto dealer in the spring or summer. What you found was an empty lot, at least as at least as far as new cars were concerned. Uh, used cars, which were your only option, in some cases sold at higher prices than the sticker prices of um, uh, uh, the equivalent new car, which wasn't available. Uh, dealer lots are far from full, but they're starting to get inventory back. Um, there are lots of signs that um, supply chains, while still clogged are beginning to alleviate. Uh, there are slightly fewer ships hanging out at sea and uh, off of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Um, and, but in other areas, the supply chain continue, uh, problems continue. I was uh, on a conference call this afternoon or this morning with Toll Brothers. Um, and they said, you know, as soon as one, um, as soon as one shortage is alleviated, uh, another one pops up. So uh, they, they were able to get one piece of material that they couldn't be able to get for two months. And then they can't get CBC pipe for whatever reason. And they said they've never made so many trips to Home Depot. Um, but at any rate, what's been happening is that the uh, time to construct their homes has actually increased by two weeks over the last 90 days. So it's not over, but it is ending in different places at different times. So as the supply chain uh, problems alleviate themselves, we should see inflation go from a peak uh, today of about 7% to about 5% by mid next year to about 3% of the at the end of the year. And it is, slight, it is reasonable that inflation will remain anchored in a two to 3% range uh, beyond uh, slightly higher than it has been over the past two decades because A, wage increases are gonna be higher in a tight labor market and because rents associated with the shortage in housing are gonna be higher as well. But there will still be plenty of deflationary uh, forces in play um, slower population growth, uh, increased use of technology to offset human labor, and that will continue to keep um, inflation in check. When it comes to interest rates, inflation are simply a factor. Now, long term, there's a high correlation, but the short term, there isn't necessarily. Um, rates, like anything else, are a function of supply and demand. So uh, there's been lots of supply 
of uh, money and with low rates, there's really no evidence that there's going to be less of that. On the other hand, U.S. government debt um, uh, deficits are going to fall drastically from um, the levels of 2020, 2020 and early 2021 into and through 2022. First of all, the government is going to be spending less on what I'll call COVID relief, uh, including, as the aforementioned, um, employment benefits. But also the rise in income and particularly the rise in uh, realized capital gains is going to really spike tax receipts. So you're gonna have a big rise, uh, much higher than currently expected in tax receipts. Uh, government spending will, be, um, will rise, but not at the rate it's risen before. Uh, you're seeing the same phenomenon at state and local levels. Uh, a year ago, states were feared that they might even have to go bankrupt because they uh, were losing, uh, they had to put money out in, in welfare payments and Medicaid, et cetera. Uh, but they too have found that incomes and, and um, tax receipts have been uh, much higher than expected. So uh, you're seeing a lot of states and a lot of municipalities uh, end 2021 in a surplus position, which is something they, they are not very used to. Uh, low rates abroad also will increase demand for US debt. Remember in most of the developed world, 10-year tra- year bonds, sovereign debt, trades at a negative yield. So um, there's been a lot of foreign money uh, chasing US debt because that's what's there. But, Negative rates will drive investable dollars away from bonds, reducing demand, and of course that will keep interest rates low. So let me move to a variety of conclusions. First of all, earnings are likely to rise at above average rates at least for the next two years. Part of that has to do with monetary stimulus, keeping the economy above average growth. There is usually about a 12 month lag between stimulus and its impact. Uh, We are still at this moment at a period of peak stimulus. The Federal Reserve is just beginning to reduce its purchases and rates stay at zero. So we're going to have that stimulus. It's going to help the economy at least through mid-2022. Uh, It's also going to take another year for all economic sectors to reopen. Uh, I don't have to be a rocket scientist to expect that restaurants, uh, movie theaters, entertainment venues, airlines, hotels, uh, will all have much better 2022 than they did in 2021. Uh, In addition, two very large sectors in terms of the economy, autos and housing are gonna uh, gonna have very strong years next year. How the auto industry uh, may get off to a slow start until all the supply chain snarls end, uh, but there is demand out there to support uh, a normal sales volume of about 17 million vehicles a year. We're at a current pace of about 13 million, and that does not include uh, dealer purchase to replenish inventory. And part of the excess savings and bank deposits rather than be invested are going to be spent. People are going to take vacations. They're going to catch up with what they missed during the pandemic, et cetera. Interest rates will get upward pressure from rising inflation, although other deflationary forces will move to keep rates down. If inflation falls back towards 3% by the end of the year, uh, it would be logical that uh, even if rates stayed where they are today, around 1.5%, Rates would still be negative, but they'd be far less negative than they are at the moment. And uh, the yield curve will continue to flatten because as um, the economy grows and as um, uh, the Fed sees the labor market uh, becoming uh, basically at full capacity, they have to be careful not to allow the economy to move too far ahead or they will invite persistent inflation, higher interest rates and economic problems. So to stay ahead of it, we should look for the Fed to begin increasing interest rates in the maybe as early as March, April, maybe as late as late summer, depending on the state of the economy at the moment. Uh, But, uh, you know, we should expect two to four rate increases next year. 
and, and similar in 2023. To give you a reminder, at the end of 2018, uh, rates got as high as 2.5% of the federal funds level. Uh, that would be using 25 basis points as the uh, normal rate of um, change. That would be 10 rate increases, and that's probably three to four years or longer down the road if we were to ever get there. PE ratios, therefore, are going to remain higher than normal. Uh, we can argue how much higher uh, if we are using 225 in terms of S&P earnings and every multiple point difference in the S&P uh, multiple is 225 points to the average or about 5%. So whether the, whether the multiple on forward earnings is 20 or 21 or 22 or 19, uh, that alone has the ability to move the market 5%. So it, it, definitely, um, it, it definitely matters where, where rates are. Uh, the flood of new money has supported excess speculation to date. Excess speculation uh, has, what it has done this year is it's moved around a lot. Um, it's, if you remember back in January, there were hundreds, literally hundreds of SPACs that were formed. These are effectively blind pools to buy something to justify the money being invested. At the beginning, prices of SPACs were doubling, tripling, quadrupling, uh, sometimes even before the um, company bought anything, just based on a belief that the founders could find something spectacularly valuable. That pretty much proved not to be true. There are still hundreds of SPACs waiting to invest, or they will have to return money back to their investors. It's not just SPACs. Um, IPOs, uh, stay-at-home stocks, etc. But this is this has really started to unwind, and and we're seeing almost the um, disaster du jour, if you want to speak. Uh, you know, uh, late last week it was DocuSign. A couple of weeks ago it was Peloton. Uh, Beyond Me. Last night it was a company called Stitch Fix, an online company that does that's basically uh, your a personal shopper uh, online. Great idea. A lot of these companies are good ideas. I don't know whether a lot of these companies make great long-term companies. So um, we're seeing a lot of this throughout uh, the market. Uh, I think there are companies out there like uh, DoorDash, Uber, uh, that still have to prove that these are viable investments and not just viable ideas. Um, none of these companies at the moment makes money and uh, they're all still uh, based on promise. My own guess is that what we saw last week, which was kind of a, a, a NASDAQ flash crash, was a warning signal. I think the rally Monday and Tuesday um, reinvigorated some confidence among the speculators and, and that move Friday and uh, Monday and Tuesday was more a warning shot than the final crescendo. Um, but if you've gotten into these speculative markets in the past, uh, like in the late 90s, uh, we had similar flash crashes in October of 1998, 1999 that culminated in the internet bubble bursting in the spring of 2000. And we could very well see that. I can't time it, but I will tell you that when it happens, uh, it, it's going to be, it'll be very messy for that part of the marketplace. Everybody remembers the internet bubble bursting. What they don't remember is in 2000, it was a fine place to be invested in Smokestack America, names like Boeing and um, Caterpillar uh, had healthy gains while the uh, internet stocks were on their way uh, in the direction of zero. Um, 20 times earnings seems to me to be a conservative target for next year. Uh, that would give me a range of 4,800 to 5,000. If you wanna make it 2,100, you have to add 225 points to the top and bottom of the range. So it could be 5,000 to 5,200. 
If it's only 1900, which would mean that probably you'll see 30 uh, 10 year treasuries well over 2%, then the, the range would be 4,600 to 4,800, uh, which would be uh, a little bit below where we are today. Uh, there are a lot of reasons I don't expect interest rates to climb that far that fast. Um, so I'm gonna stick with 4,800 to uh, 5,000, which is a low single digit return plus dividends. Um, not terrible. Certainly not the 20% plus we're seeing this year or last year, um, but rarely has the market strung, uh, strung three such years back to back to back. As monetary growth slows, um, growth at any price is gonna be supplanted by growth at a reasonable price. Um, the uh, speculative fever to survive constantly has to be fed. And the way it's gotta be fed is with new money. And if the bank, if the Federal Reserve is not pumping money in and the um, Congress is not writing trillions of new checks, uh, then the fuel to keep speculative stocks at extended levels uh, starts to dissipate. So at some point between now and the end of next year, I expect a pretty savage correction in that part of the marketplace. There will be collateral damage, but just like a hurricane, the damage is in the eye and the immediate round, uh, surrounding areas. Uh, you get 50, 100 miles outside of the eye, you lose some tree branches, some roof tiles, but basically you fix things and life goes on. Um, as for bonds, they remain unattractive. Uh, I don't see the scenario that bonds return to you a, 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 an amount that equals or exceeds the rate of inflation we're likely to see. One other comment about inflation, and I'll use an example of a gallon of gasoline because we all can talk about this. If gasoline goes from, say, two and a half dollars for regular to four dollars for regular, um, there's a pretty big spike in the inflation rate while it's going from two and a half to four dollars. If it simply stays at $4, then inflation flattens out to zero, at least inflation for gasoline. But you're still paying $4 for a gallon of gasoline, whereas a year previous, you're paying $2.5 of gasoline. So the purchasing power of your income and your wallet has dissipated. Um, that gets lost in the changes here. And it is quite likely that if inflation persists for long, even if it just flattens out, that um, our ability to spend freely, which seems to have been the case over the last six to 12 months, uh, will start to dissipate a bit. Okay, we're at a time of transition. We talked about Om uh, Omicron. I think Omicron has been over talked about. I'm not gonna spend much time other, uh, on it other than to say, hey, it's a variant, we're gonna live with it, we're getting better therapeutics, some of the vaccines or boosters work. After Omicron, there may be another variant, you don't know, but over time, these pandemics wind their course. It then becomes an endemic, which means we gotta live with it. You'll decide whether you wanna take a booster shot or not, like you decide each year whether to take a flu vaccine or not. But the good news is that the government will at some point exhaust themselves from all these requirements and let life get back to normal. Federal Reserve policy changes, we know what's gonna happen. They're gonna get, they're gonna taper the bond purchase to zero, whether it's in March or June, doesn't matter all that much. And then they will look at the way the economy is working at the time. Ultimately, if the economy is doing okay or is hotter than it should be, you're gonna see a series of rate increases to try and keep real growth somewhere in the twos because that's kind of where it is, maybe in the high twos, but you can't sustain 3% unemployment, 3% uh, GDP growth with a population growing at under seven, three quarters of 1%. And, and finally, we're probably, as I note, gonna see some unwinding of the speculative fever. Over the six, next six months, we'll get much better focus. The Fed will, we'll see what the Fed's next step is after tapering ends. 
We will see by next spring how far supply chains have resolved themselves. Certainly, um, January, February, March, relatively low demand seasonally is a good time to see uh, supply chains unwind. And we'll find out just how significant Omicron is, but it isn't going to be the last variant of the disease. Markets like certainty, growth, and low interest rates. We've, we've got two of the three. That's not bad. Uh, of these, probably the course of interest rates over the next 12 months will be most telling in terms of where stock prices end. So with that, let me stop and uh, open it up for questions. Nick? Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so the first question is, you note the huge amount of unspent savings. How much of that is concentrated in the top 10% of households? And does the lower 90% have far less savings? And what does that all mean for inflation? I don't have good numbers on that, uh, Nick. I, I mean, quite obviously, the larger percent of savings is from high-income households. Uh, we also know that low-income households spend most or all of their money because they need to. Um, so I, I don't know that the... Uh, Obviously, if you're making $25,000 a year, you're not putting a lot of it in the bank. Um, some of, it, is, some of it, uh, be, it comes about due to events. For instance, if you're an empty nester, uh, some are, are seeing the opportunity with inflated prices to sell their homes. And uh, they're not buying a new home at inflated prices. Rather, they, they're opting to rent. So uh, the the net cash supports their lifestyle going forward. One of the reasons people are allow, allowing themselves to retire. So it's a good question. I don't know that I really have the answer, um, but there is, there's no question that there's lots of money sloshing around waiting to find a home. All right. Next question says, you mentioned often uh, that the government debt doesn't really matter until it matters. So when does it matter aside from Congress deciding to default? Well, Congress is not going to default, uh, unlike other like Greece, et cetera, which doesn't print its own currency. Um, we do. Uh, the only way government defaults is if we don't increase the debt ceiling in Congress. And I, I think everybody on both sides of the aisle realizes allowing that to happen would be a disaster. So uh, get it out of your head. We're not going to default on the debt. Now, what happens besides that in terms of it doesn't matter till it matters. Well, look at Europe in 2010, 2011. I mean, you, you saw debt in places from Greece to Portugal to Italy to Spain at double digit rates. Today, all those countries, including Greece, have long term rates lower than ours. Um, it's a market phenomenon. And, you know, the, the, it's the same question as when does a bubble burst? Um, it bursts when it bursts. Uh, you know that the next breath you take to fill up the balloon might make it burst, but you might have to put 10, 15 more blows into the balloon to get it to burst. It's, it's hard to tell. All you can do is say where the ingredients are. And, and clearly, um, with 25 plus trillion dollars in debt, um, 1% increase in debt service is $250 billion a year. And you can't, you can't whitewash that. That's real cash that you got to pay out. And it's got to come from somewhere. And if you just say, well, I don't care. Well, then at some point, no one will buy your debt. You just don't know when. When it happens, though, you're in you're deep doo-doo. And so it's hypothetical. We don't know. Hopefully, it'll be a long time before we do. All right. Next question. It says stocks are a good inflation hedge, but how should the allocation change in a higher inflation environment? Well, in a higher inflation environment, assuming that it, if it's persistent, you'll get higher rates, you're going to get lower PEs. When you get lower PEs, the pure math will tell you it'll be a compression of PEs between low PE companies and high PE companies. So while growth is always important in, in pricing power in high inflation environments, uh, at the speculative end, it, it, and that gets crushed. I, I'll give you a, just a good example with a, hypo, with a rhetorical question. How many people would be buying Bitcoin if you could get 10% in your money market fund? 
a lot less than it is today. So um, it, you're, you're gonna see a rotation. Now, where do you see a rotation to? Who are your beneficiaries in, um, in times of high inflation? Well, certainly not borrowers. So the opposite, lenders. So banks would be a beneficiary. Uh, for, I always use the example of franchise companies, company like McDonald's, which is almost all franchise today, as are a lot of the uh, fast food restaurant chains. They make a, a, they make a 4% royalty. And in McDonald's case, they get an eight, they get an 8% rent. Well, if prices go up by 10%, then their royalty payments go up by 10%. Meanwhile, and their rent payments go up by 10%, but their cost of ownership of the, or control of the land won't go up by that much. So it's a windfall for those kind of companies. Then you got to search around and ask yourself, okay, oh, the other technology in terms of businesses, because you're going to be doing everything you can to replace high cost people with low cost machines. So more kiosks and restaurants, your restaurant, how many of your restaurants today have this QSR code instead of a printed menu? Um, as they, a lot of them have printed menus on the side, but over time that will disappear and we'll just, your menu will be a QSR code. Um, all these little tricks save some money. And, and with advanced robotics, et cetera, anything, it, it, a machine is gonna do what a human can do and as the machines get smarter, they're going to do more of what, uh, what more of what requires less intelligence. So it wouldn't surprise me, ten years from now, if a machine is flipping the hamburger at a McDonald's grill because it's all based on timers. No, no one's sitting there. Uh, they're flipping the hamburger when the beep tells them to flip the hamburger. Why can't a machine flip the hamburger? So that takes care of that line cook. So anything that is that, that requires fairly simple intelligence is going to get replaced by a machine in some context or some way. Great. Uh, China, can you talk briefly about what's going on with the Chinese economy and how you see that impact in the US in 2022? The Chinese economy is in deep trouble. Um, it's still growing. It's still growing faster than our economy, but they got the classic, pro they, their demographics rolled over. They, they're now in a situation where their population is about to go into absolute decline. So you tell me, how do you keep an economy growing 6% a year when your population isn't growing 6% a year, growing at, isn't growing at all? So what do they do? Well, one, you try and export to the world. Two, you move people from the rural countryside to the city where there are higher level jobs and higher level businesses, but you can do that for so long. You're seeing what's going on in Evergrande and some of the other real estate developers, and that's a total accident waiting to happen. Um, the other thing that's happening is China is kind of flailing out at the rest of the world, and that works in two ways. It, it's not making them friends, um, but it's an example of a country that, that needs to um, be a global power, and they're trying to figure out how to do it. Um, hopefully, they won't do it in the wrong way. Obviously, they would like Taiwan to be under the mainland China sphere. Uh, without starting a war. They haven't figured out how to do that yet. They're not ready to do that at this point. Um, but China is, is a real problem. The other thing is, is, um, is they try and dump stuff on the rest of the world. Eventually, the rest of the world is going to push back and say, hey, look, we're not going to accept your stuff at below market prices. Uh, you're not going to, you want to ruin your economy. You want to help your economy by ruining ours? we're not going to play with that. So there's a lot. China is certainly one of the, the big variables out there over the next, not just one year, but next two to three years. The last point I'll make about China is I can't tell everybody what to do, but I wouldn't buy a Chinese stock at all because the chairman of the board is a fellow named Xi, and I don't think he has shareholder interest at heart. 
and he's going to do whatever he wants to do, whether it's good for you as an investor or bad for you as an investor. And if you can figure out what that is, you're a better person than I am. But I, I you don't buy what you don't know. And so I would stay away from everything China. All right. Well, great. Thanks, Jim. And that's uh, the end of our question and answer session. If you have any other comments or questions, please reach out to Jim or myself. We'll be happy to get back to you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate it appreciate your interest in Tower Bridge Advisors. And uh, with that, I'll say have a great holiday and we'll see you in the new year. Merry Thanks. Christmas, everybody, and Happy New Year.